And welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jared Doak. Um, today is the beginning of a new webinar series known as NAPSIG Foundation Member, Member Innovations. And we have a network of over 20,000 first responder, public safety, GIS, and emergency management professionals uh, who are doing amazing things in their organizations to better their communities. And we wanted to highlight their great work and provide a platform uh, for them to share what they are doing uh, with the rest of the broader NAPSIG community. And for our first webinar, uh, we're going to hear about GIS for Search and Rescue, a Caribbean and International Perspective. And just a note, this will be recorded and we will post it to our website at napsigfoundation.org within a few days. Uh, so again, uh, my name is Jared Doak and I'm a program manager with NAPSIG Foundation. And I support our search and rescue community with geospatial tools and processes. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to our panelists to let them introduce themselves. Uh, first, we have Kevin Noel. And Kevin's been a, a longtime friend of NAPSIG and has been doing a lot of great things with GIS in his home country of Trinidad and Tobago. So uh, Kevin, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Hey, good day, everyone. Um, I'm Kevin Noel. I'm a professional firefighter with the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service. I have been involved in GIS uh, for most of the last 10 years, and I have been directly involved with the development of GIS capabilities for the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service. And um, currently, we are uh, expanding our, our structure. Um, to allow for greater GIS integration across our organization. So um, I'll hand over now to uh, Jeff Munder. Yes, good morning. Um, I, I am Jeff Munder. I'm a, area, a commander with Fire Emergency New Zealand with a, a focus on uh, urban search and rescue operations and supporting UAS um, capability. Uh, primarily, a lot of it's primarily focused around um, how we produce and or collect and produce uh, effective intelligence from a range of uh, remote sensors. So um, in utilizing a lot of the GIS uh, um, platforms that are available to us to, um, to deliver that at home. I'm also the chair of the INSERAG, which is the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group, um, Information Management Working Group, where we uh, look to develop and have developed um, very effective effective solutions for international um, urban search and rescue. Over to you, John. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, I'm John Morrison. I'm the Data Analytics Strategy Manager for the Fairfax County, Virginia Fire and Rescue Department uh, here just outside of Washington, D.C. in the United States. Um, that's my daytime job, and that involves dealing with data and, and geospatial data every day. Uh, and then I'm also uh, a planning section chief with the Fairfax County Urban Search and Rescue Team uh, that is one of two teams in the United States that can go around the world on behalf of the U.S. government for uh, disaster response. Um, and as part of that, I, I am the America's region representative on that information management working group uh, that, that Jeff is the co-chair of. And so with that, uh, Jared, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're also joined here today uh, by our participants. We have had over 300 people register for today. Uh, we were able to geocode uh, 270 of those. And participants uh, span emergency management, search and rescue, and fire, as well as others. And you can see we have a heavy presence in the Caribbean, some throughout the world, and then again, a lot here in the United States. And for today's objectives, uh, we really just wanted you to, to hear about what Kevin has going in Trinidad and Tobago with his fire service, also learn about workflows and employed by INSERAG, and then gain an awareness of GIS resources and best practices uh, that may be relevant to you. And so we'll hear from Kevin first, and then uh, about INSERAG. We will have a Q&A at the end. Um, if you came in a little late, we are utilizing the Q&A function. Uh, so if you have a question during the presentation, um, go ahead and put that in and our panelists will be addressing those as they can. And what, if we have any questions at the end, um, we will bring those up and then we will touch on some resources. And we may have a, a lot of new people here with us today. So I just wanted to briefly touch on what 
NAPSIG or the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation is. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit that was formed about 15 years ago as an alliance between a number of prominent national associations, some of which are shown here. And we've been involved, or we've evolved into a formal organization uh, over the course of that time. And as I stated previously, we have a member network of over 20,000 public uh, safety leaders, first responders, and GIS practitioners. And uh, we are led by a board of directors who all have had a long career in uh, public safety in the emergency management industry. And our mission is to ensure that first responders, operators, and decision makers have access to the right actionable information from preparedness through response and into recovery. And we do this uh, through a number of ways. Uh, we help define and promote consistent best practices and standards. We support exercises and simulations meant to encourage preparedness and foster collaboration. And we develop educational and training materials and make them available to our community. And finally, in some instances, uh, we help with knowledge and tech transfer. And I would encourage you to check out our website at napsicfoundation.org for, uh, for more information and resources. And now that you know a little bit more about NAPSIG, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kevin so we can uh, learn more about uh, what he's been able to implement. So I'm going to stop sharing. Kevin, you can go ahead and take it over. Yes, good day, everyone. Um, today, I'd like to, to share with you a bit about um, our experience with GIS adoption and integration in the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service. So in my presentation today, we're going to first seek to put um, the impact and importance of GIS into context for us in the Caribbean public safety community. We're going to discuss a bit about our experiences uh, in developing our strategic approach thus far. And finally, we're going to glimpse forward um, at the road I believe we must take to effectively leverage this technology and platform in the coming weeks and months um, for the Trinidad and Tobago Fire Service. So our journey into uh, GIS adoption really began about nine years ago um, when at the Water and Essential Services section of the fire service here. This is the department that's responsible for maintaining our fire hydrant networks and other related infrastructure. We started looking for a more effective way to manage the resources that we were responsible for. Um, up till that time, most of our um, data management was more or less static. We are talking about paper files and documents and record books and that sort of stuff. And, it wasn't one, we weren't able to um, have that information um, relate to our first responders, our firefighters on the ground um, during an incident uh, effectively. And two, it was very difficult to update this, this, um, this record, these records um, when things change in the field. So we realized that it was very important for us to uh, take our data management and resource management from where it was at that point in time. So a place where we could um, effectively uh, visualize and um, strategically deploy our resources. And when we started doing some more research into it, we realized that GIS really was the platform that would allow us to do this and much more. And it also gave us the ability to collaborate and interact with um, our stakeholders, both within the organization and other governmental agencies um, on a common platform. So we have thus far, um, we have integrated, um, use it well, rather we have integrated with um, our government's national um, automated construction permitting system, um, our department um, legally here in Trinidad is responsible for um, approvals of new land and building developments. So we've been able to integrate our operations with um, this, these government, other government agencies using GIS. Um, we are integrated with our Ministry of National Security's Enterprise GIS platform. 
which is what we will work with, and it allows us to collaborate and share information and resources with other um, national security uh, agencies, such as the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management, the SSA, Trent Tobago Police Service, etc. And it allows us to collaborate with these stakeholders and other stakeholders, such as um, the University of the West Indies, other governmental agencies, and so on, to build key data sets and um, applications for both our first responders and our wider community. Now, GIS, as we all know, is a rapidly evolving platform that supports data management and visualization, pre-planning and analysis, um, the development of, of um, field mobility capabilities, um, situational awareness, operational intelligence, and as I mentioned before, collaboration. And we have um, faced some challenges getting to this point. And one of the major challenges that I um, that we have faced is the issue of stakeholder buy-in. And this is both from within your organize, our organization um, at the level of, of our end users, the people who um, are doing the work in the field, getting them to understand the importance of it, that this is not just another bright idea that is just going to fall by the wayside, but as See it, seeing GIS as something that can really um, impact and improve how they work, and also at the level of our decision makers, um, getting them to understand the, the return on investment, the benefits of um, GIS to our operations and our bottom line. Um, being able to access the, the necessary resources to carry out our GIS functions to develop um, our platform has been a challenge over the years, and um, with the advent of the um, COVID um, last year and, and continuing challenges that COVID places on um, our national resources and our economies um, around the world. It's, I believe this is a challenge that we're all facing. Um, being able to effectively integrate um, GIS to our existing technology platforms um, is something that we're constantly um, working on and we have a very good relationship with our um, information technology and communication team here in Trent Tobago Fire Service as we look towards improving that data integration. And of course, having trained and experienced personnel um, on board to take this GIS um, structure forward for our organization. So uh, our strategic approach when it comes to GIS um, has involved uh, firstly, identifying what are the, the, the challenges or the problems you want to address. Um, this involves looking at um, whether we, we are trying to address an information and asset management problem, um, resource deployment, pre-incident planning. Um, and in order to do this, we firstly have to be able to assess um, where we want to play. What is the, the, the challenge that we want to address? GIS is, is the, the ability to, inter to integrate and use GIS um, is as wide as your imagination, really. Um, and for, you, for us as an organization, we've, been, we've had to firstly assess where we are um, in terms of our information technology structures, in terms of our data management, um, our workflows in the field, and as really assess what we want to attack, attack at first. Um, then we had to look at um, identifying the strategies. Um, and this involves developing um, project management, staffing, quality assurance, um, communication and change management, and risk management strategies for how we are going to rule out this. Um, I think if, not, if beyond anything else, the last um, two years has taught us the importance of digital transformation in the public safety industry. Um, it's put a lot of our systems to the test and we see the, the areas in which we need to improve to move forward um, effectively. Um, and finally, who do we need? Um, and this comes down to buy-in. Identifying who our target users are, identifying who our executive and decision-making champions and stakeholders are, and really working with them to identify not only short-term but long-term criteria for success 
identifying the work that we need to do and um, really being able to lay out a roadmap in terms of where we, how we get from where we are now to the place where GIS is integrated in, a, in the most efficient way possible for us in fire service. So looking forward, we are at the point now where we are looking at um, a more targeted approach to our GIS integration and our search and rescue teams and their functions are one of the key areas that we're looking to target. And we know that the, the role of search and rescue involves the ability to, to um, quickly and effectively locate and um, assess and uh, stabilize, recover, and even transport and to a very great extent prevent um, injury and hazards. So at its core, um, search and rescue really is inherently spatial in nature. So what are the or who and what do we need really to impact um, or to bring to bear the impact that GIS has on public safety to our search and rescue teams? So where are we going? Next steps for us, um, our search and rescue, our GIS team uh, is looking at the development of a strategic plan for the integration of GIS into the functions of the Trinidad Tobago Fire Service. Um, for our search and rescue team, that involves um, developing um, pre-configured and ready to use GIS tools. Um, so that our teams don't have to wait for uh, a GIS specialist or a GIS team member to be there in order to get to work and utilize these um, tools for their, for their functions. Um, the training of, of our staff is very important um, at this point in time. And we are working with uh, our Ministry of National Securities and Enterprise GIS team to develop training solutions. Um, just last night, we had a, a meeting with uh, the officers in charge of the uh, water and essential services sections, uh, individual units, where we were training them in field data collection um, that they will begin very shortly. Uh, then we're going to look at the development of key data sets for our fire service and our search and rescue team. Um, from as simple as um, base maps, uh, trail maps, uh, building data, community data, the ability to um, generate and, and maintain um, effective models for pre-planning and pre-incident planning. And uh, then being able to equip our staff with the physical and technical um, resources to make use of these um, resources, these data sets uh, that we're putting together for them. And then uh, development and deployment of our web and mobile um, applications and solutions as we move forward. So we understand the importance of GIS to the search and rescue community um, and to our search and rescue teams here in fire service. And it's, we're at the point now um, as we're expanding our, um, how we use GIS in fire service where we're going to start looking at putting the, the infrastructure and the resources in place to enhance our operational intelligence, to enhance the capabilities of our search and rescue teams um, by bringing GIS to bear into their operations, by improving, um, their, oper by, by improving their ability to carry out rescue and search operations, um, and also being able to develop a more preventative approach to their operations by being able to uh, mitigate against preventable incidents where possible. So um, at this point, I just want to uh, highlight the people that we've been working together with uh, to develop GIS in the fire service. And as I said, this, is a, this has been a nine year journey for us. Um, and everyone on our team here has made a very um, important impact and contribution to where we are now. And we are excited to take this forward and um, 
bring GIS to bear on the operations of not just our search and rescue team, but on the organization as a whole and the wider uh, public safety uh, industry and community here in the Caribbean. So um, any questions related to this, um, you can always put in the Q&A and um, we'll get to it at, in the question and answer period at the end of, of um, this presentation. So I wanna thank you for your time and I'll hand you over now to Jeff and John. All right, good morning or good day is probably more appropriate. And John's just gonna bring up our slides and then we'll just um, kick off the presentation that we're going to talk to you about. Um, so both John and I, as, as we mentioned before, are part of uh, um, United Nations um, INSERAG uh, Information Working Group, which manages a, a lot of the, the systems and processes or and develops a lot of these systems that support the work that, um, that we do across the world. Um, and a lot of it's uh, very strongly based on around our, our ESRI, ESRI products and in, in our case, ICMS, which is our information and coordination and management system. Um, so we'll just, uh, we'll just kick on through and, and, and go through the, the presentation for you. And we're going to give you some context. So in, in Sarawak itself is, a, is an advisory group that sits across the world. Uh, there's about um, 90 countries that are involved in, in Sarawak and in that in those 90 countries is about 56 um, active USAR teams. And um, the, the group itself is, um, our focus was to develop and work through um, developing a, an effective system to manage the field-based operations uh, within, within the environments we work in. Next slide, please, uh, John. Right, so um, if we go to the next one as well, John, that we'll give you a little bit of a history of, of where it's come from. Um, what was, what's made the system reasonably successful is the fact that it was based on um, known and proven methodology. Um, and that was in place, paper-based systems, as, as, as Kevin has mentioned, you know, they, they tend to be a little bit limited in effectiveness when rescuers are in a, in a sudden onset disaster. Um, Although we know that rescuers or especially first responders dislike change, um, and we did try a number of other ways of going about um, doing this, we did we did end up with a we ended up in a place where it was very important to be able to develop an electronic or digital based system. Our um, the working group was was formed, and as part of that, we were trying to work on a on a on a system that had been introduced to us um, that was uh, uh, open source, free, free, free for use. And we did find that it, we really struggled to get it to work as it had a lot of limitations. So after the, the Kobo group, Kobo project had um, come run its course, uh, we then moved into a, a new era in 2020 where we, we looked to use ArcGIS and develop a system that was, would enable us to do that. The Kobo project itself was was very valuable in, in, in the fact that whilst it was a limited so solution to us um, and, and it, it, it didn't it wasn't able to extend to the, to the extent that was required to meet the needs of the organization it did it did provide um, a baseline for introducing digital technology into the into the workplace um, and it had a had a, an effect of preparing people for a better solution one of, the, one of the key challenges when you introduce digital solutions that aren't going to meet the needs of the users is that it has a very limited lifespan before it starts to become uh, detrimental to your goals. Um, as we said before, it did, um, it did enhance our, our ability to introduce ICMS. So where did ESRI come in for us? Um, and sorry, the, the IMWG, uh, we looked at to find the best solution available. There, was a, there are a number of um, different options. Um, many of our member organizations already did use um, uh, ESRI-based products. And he, here in New Zealand, we had a number of quite significant earthquakes where we were finding that we were trying to develop solutions um, on the fly. You know, it's pretty much like trying to build an airplane while you're flying it. 
Um, but um, what we did is, as our organization was already uh, a fairly ESRI uh, compliant, what we did is we built a solution um, and that solution enabled us to, to um, be very effective in, in the field and it also provided a platform and an introduction for us to be able to build a, our ICMS, which was a, is a unique um, product that works specifically for the USAR teams in the international space. So for us, the, the working group was developed and formed in about 2017, and it, it was really a, a, a move as we started to move into the to, to the ESRI-based um, professional um, products that we wanted to develop for for the for the UN. Um, we moved away from Kobo. We we did a lot of work around. Um, adapting and and moving um, into the into the new system, uh, a lot of work was done around the testing. Um, went out to our teams and, and asked what they wanted. And this and this included um, functions like quality assurance. Um, and then in around about 2020, when we were still able to go around the world, um, we we d deployed the, deployed it to the Insurag environment and uh, quite successfully. At this stage, this must be you. <laughs> it is, yes. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so ICMS is built with with some of the the features of the ArcGIS Esri platform. Um, as you can see, what what we wanted to do was yet we actually wanted to uh, make sure that uh, and the slides are auto advancing, so that's why they keep flopping forward. So I, I apologize for that. Um, but what we wanted to do was make sure that um, every disaster had its own specific set of forms and data so that there could be no mixing of data when we are deployed for potentially two disasters at once across the world. Um, and so we, we were very cautious of that. Uh, and that's why uh, each ICMS instance is built with five independent five dashboards that are sort of uh, built together, uh, a bunch of feature layers, survey one, two, three forms, web maps, web applications, and it's all created by a Jupyter notebook. Um, the Jupyter notebook provides us the ability to keep a master copy of all those elements of ICMS and then build a new standalone version specific for each disaster response. Uh, the notebook copies the master template elements and then remaps those new elements to reference each other ensuring that that cross-contamination of data won't happen. As Jeff mentioned, uh, we use Survey123 and Explorer for ArcGIS. Uh, that allows us to do both online and offline data collection. Uh, Insurag is mainly focused on earthquake response. We'll talk a little bit more later about some of the, uh, the depending on where you are in the world, hurricane, typhoon, cyclone responses. Um, but after an earthquake and after any real natural disaster, land-based mobile networks are often either offline or swamped with usage. Uh, so Survey123's offline option allows us to keep doing that critical data collection. And then records can be synced once a mobile or satellite network is reached. Uh, Explorer allows uh, responders to access those maps showing worksites and then provides links to create follow-on reports in Survey123, where common information between record types can be pre-populated, removing duplicative entry. And remember, we moved from a paper-based process with a set of forms uh, actually over to um, this digital thing. So we kept some of the same elements of the form. So we'll go through a quick timeline of an incident and how our system works. Uh, so we have what we refer to as our shaky city. Um, so the incident occurs. Uh, teams from around the world will go ahead and put their team fact sheet in, telling us uh, what their capabilities are and their arrival information. Once they arrive, the recon phase occurs and begins, and the worksite triage forms are submitted. And that allows us to prioritize the rescue work around the city so that we can do the most good for the most people. Once work sites are identified, teams are tasked in the operations phase to perform the rescue work and report on the victims that have been rescued. So going through our dashboard a little bit, it mirrors the timeline of an incident. Uh, it's tabbed across the top. 
um, to ensure the correct information is presented to the users based on their current needs. And it really allows for emergency managers to visualize the current progress across the entire disaster response. Uh, we've broken out the logical areas into worksite metrics along the left, um, worksite um, assignment and completion metrics, as well as team summaries. Uh, so we can sort of see where people are and what they're doing. The team summary page is broken out into a listing of teams, their capabilities, an expected arrival timeline, which is key for coordination with airport logistics and customs and immigration officials, a map of the team's base of operations, and their demobilization information. The triage phase, during that phase, the rapid collection of data is incredibly important and has to be accurate. Our triage data dashboard is broken down into worksite metrics, information on trap survivors found during triage broken out by sector, counts of different buildings by sector, and then a list of maps showing the worksite locations. And this sort of prioritizes and gives a quick uh, algorithm for our, our coordinators to really prioritize the work sites and figure out where we can send our, our limited resources to go do rescue. Within the operations phase, our dashboard is broken out into work site reporting metrics, mapping of sites and their status, as well as detailed victim information. The logistics phase brokes, is broken out into items requested, requests being processed, and then completed requests. So we can see, for example, if we have a limited amount of cranes uh, or a limited amount of lumber, where that can be most appropriately utilized. The photo gallery allows photos taken with Survey123 to be visualized by any other team. This is really an important factor in rescue preparation. As the old adage goes, a picture is sort of worth a thousand words. Many times the triaging team is not the rescuing team. So a photo of a work site allows the rescuing team to prepare the appropriate tools and equipment prior to leaving their base of operations. Custom web mapping applications provide coordination teams the ability to sectorize cities into smaller areas and allows USAR teams to review and approve field submitted reports prior to visualization on a dashboard. One of the most important findings through our development cycles, and we'll talk about the iterative design here in a minute, uh, was that decisions were being made by incident coordinators based on invalid information. We don't wanna make bad decisions faster. So by adding a team approval flag to our Survey123 forms, we ensured that quality control was in place before records appeared on the dashboard for action. A small counter illustrated here on the right shows the number of records awaiting quality assurance review and then highlighted those waiting for more than three hours to ensure that they weren't being overlooked. Jeff, I'll turn it over to you for the iterative design. Right, iterative design. So um, as you'll probably all know, uh, successful systems and processes don't just magically appear um, as success. And for us, this was, the, this was the case. We had a lot of work around testing and trial and feedback um, and the previous QA system is an example of feedback from our teams that we introduced into the system. You know, success isn't a straight line. It's a, it's a very rough, rough and, and really journey sometimes. And for ICMS, we, we piloted the system through a number of exercises. We, we, we had the opportunity to go to Denmark where the Netherlands team um, was very brave and allowed us to use um, ICMS in its infancy as part of one of the of their classifications. Um, so very important for us that we were able to be um, very flexible and meet the needs of our of our stakeholders. In, in this case, the USAR teams. Um, and so we we provided a system of, of feedback and change um, that that was very much part of what we ended up with today. All right, so one of the things that, um, one of the key things that happened for us um, was the event that took place in um, Beirut as it was the first time we were able to operationalize, the first time our system was operationalized. Um, and uh, so after testing within the IMWG group teams, we, we did a number of major um, exercises 
Um, we had a presentation through into our team leaders group, which happens every year. This is very important because this is where all the management and the stakeholder buy-in has occurred over the time that makes the opportunity to deliver these, these type of systems effective. It's no point just dropping something in cold that nobody's had any input into. If the upper, upper levels of the organization um, haven't bought into it, provide you resourcing and, and providing um, some strategic direction around where they would like it to go as well as the teams, you are going to struggle uh, to be effective in any type of solution that you deliver. Um, we deployed uh, into, the, into the environment around about March 2020, um, and um, we had, you know, COVID came along, which created a, a, obviously a range of issues because for, for us here in New Zealand, it arrived on as, as an issue in March, in around about March, just as we delivered it. So a lot of the work that we had to undertake um, in the last year or so is, is definitely around how do we put virtual training processes in place and uh, of course, uh, in the middle of all that, there was uh, the major port explosion in Beirut. Now, that was where we, um, the ICMS was first deployed into Beirut. And, and for us, it was quite interesting because it wasn't really in, deployed into the environment that it had been specifically designed for, um, but, we, but it worked very, very well. And it provided an opportunity for us to look at a number of, of opportunities to extend or enhance the, the, pro, the program. Next one, please, John, I've just lost my, so I'll leave that to you then. Yeah, so, so one of the things that we found is um, not only is this great, the situational update and, and this quick um, sort of triage of information is great in earthquakes, um, it's also great in island responses. And, and we found in uh, Hurricane Dorian, when our team was sent over to the Bahamas, uh, to the island of Abaco, um, we actually didn't have a great system to to track this. So we reached out, uh, the, uh, our, our USA team reached out to our New Zealand counterparts and said, hey, can you help us? I, I know that they have a lot of responses to uh, some of the islands out in the Pacific. Can you set up a quick dashboard for us? And within a few hours, uh, they stood up a dashboard with some form uh, to go through and collect. And this is sort of the illustration of, of uh, what it looks like. And it allows us to very quickly uh, give a great picture to the emergency managers of, you know, we've walked around, we've seen these buildings, these buildings are uh, red, these buildings are yellow, whatever the, the sort of um, metric would be for what that classification means at the direction of the local emergency management authority. Um, and it paints a great picture. And then you can also flag things like critical infrastructure. Um, so for example, this is a police station, or this is a grocery store, um, or, or things that need to be sort of a higher priority, because while people are displaced, uh, having no critical infrastructure available uh, certainly hampers the ability to move uh, into a recovery phase. Uh, so we, it's a very simple form that, that we sort of created on the fly, um, but it was really impactful and, and allowed both our folks that are in our base of operations, as well as those that were uh, with the, the team at the local emergency management authority, to really visualize the progress of where we were going, how fast we were meeting our objectives for, for moving around the different islands uh, to, to do those sort of works uh, and, and talk to people and, and see where the issues are so that we can present them back. So just let me add too, one of, one of the key things in, in this, we call it a DART, DART model, which is a disaster assistance response team. It has a much broader um, scope than, than our Insurag one. So for example, our, our Insurag dashboard and system is, 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 is based on a, a very, quite a, a, quite a closed system. It's, it's very, it's much easier to be able to predict what our outcomes are. Whereas if you can imagine a, a deployment into um, isolated townships or, or the Pacific Islands is, is that you, you need to be able to build a system that is flexible and um, adaptive enough that when you land in another country or even in our in, in the case of New Zealand in, in a remote area on the South Island, for example, that when you talk to the local emergency management agency, you have a system that's able to be stood up and doesn't have to be built on the fly again, but is it, it is flexible enough to be able to cope with the, with the requests of these people for what they might want. If you look at this particular slide, for example, the red, green and yellow markers are all um, part of a discussion or a briefing that you have before you deploy. So you're able to 
um, decide what red, green, and yellow mean um, as you move out the door. And so it might be different for depending on where you are. So the ability to, of the system to be flexible and adaptable in, in a range of situations is important. And especially when you have a very you know, wide scope and, and flexible um, operating environment with a range of sudden onset disasters and needs. So where, where are we going next? Uh, there's a bunch of, of directions we're going with unmanned aerial systems integration, uh, team-based squad level management, uh, as well as data sharing with partners across the humanitarian space, which will enable improved coordination among all rescue and recovery efforts. Um, here's our contact information. So if you have any questions, and I'm sure um, it'll also be in the presentation and, and what Jared sends out. Um, but if you have any questions and want to reach out to us, we're, uh, we're happy to uh, take any questions that we can. And Jared, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, I think I will start with one for Kevin. Um, Amanda says, uh, awesome pioneering work on GIS. I would like to ask whether your team has considered efforts to establish core SAR team uh, that functions across the Caribbean to support coordinated GIS SAR efforts. Um, I, I believe that currently, um, the core response team for the Caribbean um, would be John's team, if I'm correct. John? Sorry, say that one more time, Kevin. Um, the the um, and so our response team for, for my region, I believe it's, it's your team. Yeah, so if, I mean, there are four Inserog classified teams in the Western Hemisphere, and that's uh, the two U.S. teams, which are Fairfax County, Virginia, and Los Angeles County, California, as well as Colombia uh, and Chile. Um, so those teams are, are pretty much who we'll, we'll call on um, for support. Uh, however, I believe that um, the work that, that we're doing here with GIS, as well as um, some work going on with um, CIDEMA and CIDERA actually kind of put us in a place where we can now look at um, integrating the work of, of local teams in all different um, different territories here in the region to, to move towards that, that place where we can have that, that um, interact team based maybe here in the Caribbean. And um, hopefully coming out of this, um, some discussions can be had between um, Interag and some of the local territories that have local response teams um, through the Caribbean Association of um, Fire Chiefs and so on to look at improving those capabilities. Great, thank you. Uh, now we, we have a couple of questions for uh, Jeff and John. Um, how is your experience with doing remote training? Um, they've suggested that they've used story maps uh, for training content and linked to the mobile apps and found that really helpful. Uh, can you speak to your, your training uh, that you do for your teams? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, what we found is really impactful is, and this happened in Beirut actually, was just just in time training at the scene where we can train somebody in data collection in about five or 10 minutes. Um, but what we've done with remote training is we've hosted webinars uh, throughout the world. So I think we've done about four or five webinars now uh, focused on each region. So the Asia Pacific region, uh, the Africa, Europe and Middle East region and the Americas region um, that really was you know, built around for all the 56 or so Inserog teams. We want to get them up to, to date on how to use this. Um, and it was about a two hour pretty in-depth training um, that, that we went through. And it also focused not just the data collection because that's fairly simple. It's, it's more um, so, some of the workflows and how people were used to the forms and how those forms then became uh, workflows within the, the, um, within the dashboard and the ability to task teams and how some of that worked. So it's a little bit nuanced into how our particular system works, uh, but the remote training uh, went, went fantastically well. Uh, and was and was sort of hosted by the UN 
uh, for, for all of our teams. Uh, as we go forward with remote training, we're, we're sort of looking for all of the Interog teams to then train the non-Interog teams in their region uh, and sort of farm it out uh, so that you know, teams in South America may reach out to Colombia and Chile, Canada may reach out to the Americas uh, or to, to the US teams. Um, you know, so, so we're sort of looking at that partnership and a, and a train the trainer model. But uh, to the question, uh, the hub, the ArcGIS hub has been really a great way for us to embed videos um, as well as direct links to all of the individual um, pieces and parts of the ICMS system. Thank you. Um, are your dashboards public or have you templatized them at all for people to um, maybe reproduce those? They are not currently public. They're, they're behind um, the Inserog AGOL uh, account. Uh, we are actually going through a, um, a rewrite right now uh, where we just rewrote some of the code to make it a little more efficient to deploy as well as incorporating some of the changes uh, that happened with some of our Inserog forms uh, that, that went live last year. Um, and so we don't have them public. Um, there may be some opportunities to take some of the, uh, the hurricane response or the, the cyclone response data or, and templatize those. But right now they're all sort of built within our own systems uh, just because they don't necessarily, um, especially the Interog stuff, have applicability outside um, because the whole idea is we want everybody to be using one system, all of these teams. And if we have standalone systems all over the place then that, that don't talk to each other, it kind of defeats the purpose of one common operational platform. Great. Um, are you able to give any uh, further examples or an overview of the US UAS integration? I yes. A lot of people are inter interested in uh, drones. Yeah, so, so one of my roles here in New Zealand is that I, I manage our national um, yeah, uh, fire and emergency and USA uh, UAV program or UAS program um, around integration of UAS um, product into into these um, systems. Primarily for us, it's around initially it's around effective uh, high definition auto mosaic imagery um, that we can put map uh, over. Uh, sorry, we can introduce a layer um, underneath all our um, recon data that allows the people looking at the maps to have, have a, a current up-to-date information or current up-to-date understanding of, of what's going on or what the ground looks like. It also provides decision makers with um, you know, real-time opportunity. The, the, some of the information and things that we're looking at in the future are around how do we integrate some 3D imagery for, for tasking. So imagine if you can give um, you know, the, the commanders or the, the, the leaders of uh, first response units, a 3D image of the building that they're going to in, you know, an hour or so before they even land in country. Um, other things are around live video feeds um, so that you've got situational awareness that can be introduced into into the um, information suite. So it's, it's a whole range of the, of the types of products that UAV produce, um, whether we're allowed to um, slide through um, you know, a whole range of different UAV products because as you, people are interested in UAS, you'll know that, that the amount of products and the amount of technology and that, that UAV is able to produce is, a, is kind of on a bit of a, bit of a vertical um, after burning um, change, change curve. So yeah, so we're looking to introduce it and to pro provide enhanced situational awareness. And we can go on and answer that one for Mr. Dowdy as well, if you like, Jared. Yes, if you would, please. Yeah, so one of the interesting things we're doing, um, working with FEMA and, and Paul Doherty, uh, some of you might know him, is, is around how um, in, in the event of a major earthquake, especially in the US, about how we would link up the, the information systems like ICMS with the FEMA um, systems. I've been blessed to be introduced to the, the US um, layered approach to this. <laughs> and um, and so it's it's how we would uh, work, you know, between the, the 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 cities, the metros, the state, and the and the and the federal um, di different systems, and how that we make the information that's been captured on the Interreg side of the world um, in the US, and how we would make that sure that it would have value add or provide um, um, information that was compatible 
between the US and international system. So we're doing quite a lot of work with Paul around that. We've got a, a bit of a, a working group about how we're able to, to link these um, information together and how together we can probably work to influence changes in both areas that makes it more effective. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at with that. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I think I just have uh, one last question uh, for Kevin and I know you had uh, addressed it already in the chat, but I know some people may not be uh, looking there, but um, was your GIS, was it developed in-house with support or, um, or was it, uh, did you contract it out? Uh, our GIS was actually developed in-house um, with support from NAPSIG, uh, University of the West Indies Geomatic Department, um, Ministry of National Security, uh, EGIS team. So everything that we've done thus far has been in-house. Great, great work. All right, I think we've gone through our questions. Uh, I just wanted to touch on some actions and next steps. If you um, are interested in the INSRAG system, uh, you can visit INSRAG.org to learn more about that. Um, for uh, US-based uh, uh, people who are interested in USAR or even others across, across the world, we host, NAPSIG hosts a um, monthly geospatial coordination call. Um, it's essentially just a, a tech hangout where we briefly talk about uh, what we've been up to the past month, um, go over some tech updates, and um, it just really helps with uh, coordination um, before events. Uh, if you are interested in that, uh, we'll drop a link in the chat uh, for you to sign up for our interest list, and you'll we'll, you'll be added to our email list. I, I'd also like to encourage you to check out the NAPSIG Foundation resources. We have a broad spectrum of resources uh, for across public safety. Um, one of our main tools, we have a, a symbology tool that you can use um, for standard symbology. Uh, we also have links to previous uh, webinars that we have done. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to bring your awareness. Uh, NASA is doing a uh, satellite observations for analyzing natural hazards on small island nations uh, training course and it's August 18th through the 26th. There are several different uh, sessions and you can sign up at that link there. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. And I'd like to thank our presenters. I think we, we kicked off a great webinar series and we'll be looking forward to adding more to this in the future. So thank you all for your participation and um, we'll be this ends the webinar. Thank you.